Joining me now is Alderwoman Megan Alia Green. Thank you so much for being with us. Not a problem. So we do have an upcoming election. Introduce yourself to the voters. Sure. I'm Megan Alia Green. I'm the 15th Ward Alderwoman. I've represented the 15th Ward since 2014. Uh, prior to that, I spent almost a decade working in uh, education, predominantly in early childhood education arena. Uh, you know, I'm running for president of the board right now because I think we need to build a better future for our kids. Running for a vacancy, a seat that is left vacant uh, because of now admitted to crimes by the former board president. Yes. What are your thoughts about that? And, and do you have concerns that corruption like that runs deeper in City Hall? Yeah, I mean, the, the Board of Aldermen has a huge black eye at the moment, and the next president is going to have their work cut out for them to restore trust in city government, particularly in the Board of Aldermen. I mean, I, I think that there's a number of things that we can do to, you know, help give, the, help give residents a little bit more confidence in us. Um, one of those things is we need to make sure that our meetings are fully transparent. You know, right now we call committee hearings at the 11th hour. I think we should be having a set schedule so that residents know public safety committee is going to meet always on this day at this time. The HUDS committee is always going to meet on this day at this time. And any documents that are given us to us to review, I think also need to go up on the city website so that residents in our city can be having access to the same information we have access to to make decisions. Um, I think small steps like that can really help to um, restore some of the confidence in the board. Have you ever been approached uh, by someone offering a, a cash bribe? Not a cash bribe, no. It's, it, but you, you know, over the years you hear a lot of stories and, um, and I, when you talk to everyday residents in our city for a long time, even before these recent incidents, trust in city government has been low and trust in the board of aldermen has been low and um, and so that means that we really have to work to to get the city to trust us again top of mind for a lot of residents is crime yeah. always is when it comes to specifically violent crime yeah if you were to get this position what would be some of your first actions so i think we need to be looking at investing more in crime prevention we have been uh i think investing a lot in a uh, very reactive model to public safety. But there are some really good models from other cities that I think we can incorporate in St. Louis. Um, there was one thing that was done in Richmond, California called Operation Peacemaker. Um, and through that program, they basically approached folks that had either been uh, convicted of a gun, gun crime or who had shown up to a hospital with a, a, a gun violence wound at some point in time. And they went to them and they said, look, you're not going down a, a good path. What, do, what needs to happen to set your life on a different trajectory? And so they started working with these individuals, getting them into uh, to stable housing or childcare or education. Um, they gave them monthly stipends as long as they engaged in the, this program. And what they found is over a, a five-year period, their uh, violent crime rates dropped by almost 55%. I think we can do things like that in St. Louis too. We just have to uh, decide that we want to do things a little bit differently than they have we have been and really in, put some investments into crime prevention. A lot of people would say violent crime is directly linked to access to guns and to mm -hmm. gun violence. What would you do to, so to speak, fight Jefferson City when their values don't always align with St. Louis City values? Well, I think that the lawsuit that St. Louis City and Kansas City have waged against the preemptive gun language, I think is a really good start. Um, we need to be using every tool in the toolbox to take back our control. You know, we are fighting with two hands behind our backs right now um, if we can't stop the flow of guns into our communities. So I think that's a really good step and I'm looking forward to seeing how the courts play out. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that we have a good case here um, in order to get us back some of our, our rights to be able to uh, regulate guns. Would people see you in the halls of the Capitol? Would you be trying to talk with the governor? Definitely. I mean, I, I think it is incumbent upon all elected officials in this city to not just be talking with our governor, but talking with state reps and state senators from across the city or from across the state. Uh, because, you know, I grew up in a, a rural area. I understand, you know, hunting and I understand gun ownership in a rural community, which can often look a lot different than what we're encountering in the cities. Um, and so we need approaches that allow for both, right? Um, and I think by giving back St. Louis and Kansas City our rights to be able to pass laws that regulate guns, um, it could do a lot to help us address our local issues 
um, while still allowing other municipalities across the state to implement their own gun laws. What about nonviolent or maybe even, say to speak, nuisance crimes like yeah. car thefts? We've been seeing a lot of yeah. those, um, home break-ins. What yeah. needs to be done there? You know, a lot of these types of crimes are a result of drug-seeking behavior. You know, we have a huge fentanyl epidemic in this city right now. And uh, we see folks who are, you know, breaking into people's garages or cars, trying to steal items so that they can pawn um, to be able to get access to drugs. Treatment is very hard to come by in the city. And, you know, as president of the board, one of the things I'm committed to is making sure that our health department actually has the funding that it needs to be a robust health department, one that offers comprehensive uh, substance abuse care, one that offers mental health counseling, one that um, offers, you know, STD testing, um, all of these things that we really need to have robust systems for if we uh, want to get a handle on some of those petty crime rates. Would you support raising salaries or growing the police department? We have seen some reporting that police officers are leaving the city, especially to go to other departments or just leaving the field altogether. Is that a component of fighting the crime issue? Do you think we need more police or less? I think that we are at a place where we have one of the highest staff police departments per capita in the country, which tells me that what we're doing is not using our resources as effectively as we could. Um, we have a very top heavy police department that I think sometimes promotes folks off the streets. I think we need to look at that structure to ensure that the force that we have is able to actually be on the streets. I think that's number one. Um, number two, we have to recognize that again, we need to focus on crime prevention. You know, we, we often call police after a crime has already occurred and ask them to show up. What we need to be investing in is those things that we know make a difference in people's lives to prevent that crime from happening in the first place. That is mental health care. That's substance abuse. That's uh, opportunities for youth to have productive places to, to you know, engage with um, and not be just out on the streets, you know, stealing cars and things like that. Um, and so I, it, it's an and. Um, I do think that city, uh, that employees across city government need to have raises. Um, we cannot get enough trash truck drivers. We cannot get enough uh, folks to do tree trimming. And I think it all boils down to wages. And so the city needs to become more competitive with the wages and benefits that we offer across the board. And I do want to touch on that. But, but first, when it comes to the Kia issue and, yes. and Hyundai issue, do you support the mayor's efforts there and going after the manufacturers? Should they be held accountable or someone else accountable? I mean, I, I think, again, it's a both and. You know, obviously, we have to hold accountable the people that are stealing the cars and, and joyriding. Um, and I think that there's some culpability for these corporations as well. Um, why have they not issued a recall? They know that this uh, is a defect. They know that this is wreaking havoc on cities across the country. Um, it seems like they should be recalling all of these vehicles, fixing this defect. Um, so we can't continue having the number of car thefts that we are. You mentioned city services. We hear from citizens complaining from 911, trash pickup to potholes. Mm -hmm. Would you say that city government is currently failing citizens on some of those basic city services? I think city government has a lot of challenges right now in fulfilling those city services. One of them is we are hurting for workers, um, just like every other entity. You know, we have almost a thousand vacancies right now in city government. Um, we need to raise wages. We need to make sure that we are competitive um, with other municipalities and other type of similar jobs. We need to offer better benefits to our employees. That could look like, you know, subsidizing childcare so that folks could engage in the workforce. It could look like, you know, down payment assistance um, so that folks will buy a house and live in the city and, um, and, and come and work for the city. I think there's a lot of ways that we could support our workers um, in ways that would entice them and incentivize them to come and work for the city. Other things we need to do is to take a more holistic view to city services. Um, historically, we have had this very hodgepodge delivery system where, um, you know, there's different rules in different wards. That makes it really challenging to provide city services at uh, a level of scale. You know, I think we need a citywide plan for streets instead of having all of these traffic calming measures um, and street paving just done out of ward capital at a ward by ward basis. 
Um, and I, I think we need to uh, reevaluate some of the decisions we've made with our, uh, with our trash trucks. Our trash trucks are only capable of picking up our dumpsters. So if we get in a place where our trash trucks break down, we can't go to a neighboring municipality and say, hey, could we rent some trash trucks from you? We can only get them from one specific manufacturer, and it often takes two years to get a new truck. I think we need to be phasing over to a system um, where our dumpsters and our trucks uh, you know, work in the same way that they do in neighboring municipalities. So if we need to borrow trucks, rent trucks, we have the capability to do that and know that they can pick up trash. The mayor has endorsed your candidacy. Yes. What would you say to somebody though who says, would it be more of the same with you being president of the board if some of these services are not working under her leadership for those who, who would criticize her leadership? Others obviously think she's doing a great job as well. What would be different about you working with her then? I want to be clear that city services have not worked for a majority of our city for a long time. You know, our mayor's been in office for a little bit over a year. Um, these issues with trash, these issues with speeding cars or lack of infrastructure improvements are not new issues. Uh, and I think expecting any mayor just to fix it all in a year is asking a little bit much when we've had just years and years and years of delayed maintenance and disinvestment in, uh, in some of these city services. You know, I think what, we, what our city needs is stability. Um, the mayor and I have a great working relationship with each other. Um, we're on the same page. We know how to work through our disagreements in productive ways that still move the city forward. And I think especially after seeing the turmoil at the Board of Aldermen, it's really important that we have a president of the board and a mayor who knows how to work together, who knows how to collaborate, and stop some of this infighting that we've seen for really over two decades at this point. Would you stand firm if you disagreed with her? Uh, I would, yes. I mean, she and I do not agree on everything, and but there are ways that you can disagree that are still productive. And I think what we have lacked in City Hall, by and large, is that productive disagreement and being able to say, I don't agree with you, but you're not you know, on my hate list now, right? I can still work with you. We can still work on all these other issues together. Or we can find some kind of consensus or compromise around the issue. That's what we should be aspiring to. A lot of people kind of shocked and appalled when SLPS announced they'd be cutting so much bus service. Yeah. What was your reaction to that and, and can you work with the Board of Education to see what can be done about that? Yes, I, I mean I have the endorsement of just about half of the members of the Board of uh, Education and it's because I've been a longtime advocate for SLPS and our public education system. You know the thing that the Board of Aldermen has control over that most impacts our schools are TIFs and tax abatements, these you know, tax incentives that uh, we authorize for developers in our city. As many folks probably know, 60% of property taxes go to fund public education. So when we um, give out too many of these tax incentives or give them out to projects that don't need them, that is money that our public school system is missing out on. And that's money that could go to pay bus drivers more so that we can recruit the bus drivers that we need to actually get kids to school on time. Yeah, tied to development, of course. Yes. Would that hurt bringing business, though, to the city? Some people would argue that that's the reason we have those incentives and, and tax abatements to get the businesses here in the first place. Would that be difficult then? So I think it's a balance. You know, I'm never one of those people that's going to say, you know, zero tax incentives, you know, all the time, right? But we have to be intentional, right? We've been uh, authorizing many tax incentives for luxury apartments, luxury condos um, that are really unattainable for a lot of folks that live in the city. Um, to me, if, if you are wealthy enough to be able to live in a $3,000 a month uh, apartment, I think you can pay a ta the fair share of taxes on that too. And I think the developer that's getting the, the income off of that can pay that fair share of taxes. Um, you know, it's, it's not a zero sum game. Our goal needs to be A, to have a citywide development plan so that every developer knows what area of the city they can qualify for what level of tax incentive. Um, and two, what kind of public benefits they would be required to have as part of the development. And those public benefits could be, you know, affordable housing set-asides or a payment in lieu of taxes to the school district or some infrastructure improvements. Um, 
And then last, I think the goal has to be to have the least amount of tax incentive necessary for a project to still move forward. Um, that is not something we've been doing. We have not had, I think, the oversight that has been needed on a lot of these projects to make sure that they can move forward, but that we're also growing our tax base, not just in 15 years, but today. Much of the development has gone to the Cortex or Midtown. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing or is that problematic for the South Side, for Downtown and for North Side? Well, I think we have to be using some of the development in the Central Corridor to leverage development in other areas of the city. You know, when we look at the, uh, the reauthorization of the foundry TIF. Uh, $1.5 million of that was, was taken to then put into home repair programs that would then benefit Northside residents. I think we should be doing more of that. We also need to recognize that the Central Corridor is a really stable area now. We should be scaling back the amount of tax incentives that that area of the city gets. Um, and then areas that do need that investment, areas like the north side, some of southeastern city that still have a lot of disinvestment. Um, we need to be encouraging developers if they want their, you know, a larger tax incentive to go and redevelop in those areas. Do we need a thriving downtown or do we need to move away from that idea? I, I don't think it's a, an either or. I think we have to have a strong downtown, but we also have to have strong neighborhoods. And uh, we can't redevelop neighborhoods at, or downtown at the expense of our neighborhoods. Um, you know, we also have to recognize that with the pandemic, work has changed. Um, a lot of office space probably is not going to go back to being used in the same way it does pre-pandemic with so many folks working from home. Uh, and so I think we need to reimagine what downtown looks like. How do we get more people to live downtown? How do we make sure that all the amenities are down there um, to, to attract residents? When you have more people living somewhere, it inherently increases safety. Um, and that inherently then makes more people want to go downtown. Um, but we can't do that at the expense of, our, our, of other areas of the city. Um, that development that's done in, in downtown really needs to be used to spur development in other areas. Make sure that we can still provide good city services um, because if we're building but, and we're bringing in more folks but we can't provide the level of city services that they require because we haven't grown our tax base at the same time, then we're not really a whole lot better off than we were before. The earnings tax, the 1%, should it stay or should it go? I think it definitely should stay. You know, the earnings tax is a third of our city budget. It is essential to be able to provide uh, city services and for the city to govern. And it's also our most equitable kind of tax, right? Um, we have very high sales taxes in this city, and unfortunately that puts a disproportionate impact on low-income folks. Uh, the earnings tax, on the other hand, is, um, is a mechanism that brings much more equity to that taxation system. A large influx of money potentially from the RAM settlement. There's still yeah. some undisbursed ARPA funds as well. What do you want to see happen with that big windfall of money? Yeah. So I think with this windfall of funds, we really need to be planning for the future. You know, one of those things is I think part of the NFL money needs to be set aside um, and used to uh, address deferred maintenance. We're really good at building new things in the city and we're not always good at maintaining them um, once they've been built. And I think using a portion of these funds um, as a maintenance fund to sustain these infrastructure improvements that we're making in perpetuity um, is one of the priorities we have to make. Second thing that I would really like to see us do um, is invest in creating a robust early care and education program for the city. You know, kids are behind, uh, you know, can fall behind if, if they're not on, on like grade level by, by age three, right? There's often called a, a 30 million word gap um, by age three for kids that are lower income versus kids that are higher income. And we know when kids don't have good access to early childhood education or nutrition um, or are exposed to lead at a young age, it all hurts brain development. Um, and so it makes it harder for them to be successful when they uh, get into primary school and beyond. And it also has long-term impacts on our crime rates. I think if we invested in creating a a robust early care and education program that could care for kids, you know, starting at birth, then that A, allows um, many women who have not returned to the workforce since COVID to engage in the workforce if they have affordable childcare. Um, and two, it helps us set our kids on the right track from the very beginning. And that's gonna pay off dividends for our city in the long term. 
time to get real here. What do you want voters to know about your opponent, Jack Coder? You guys are both alders, obviously. Yeah. Some people would say you're very similar in a lot of your ideology. Mm -hmm. What's different and what do you want them to know about him? You know, I, I think uh, Alderman Coder and I are pretty different people. You know, I championed passing the minimum wage in the city and raising it to $11 an hour. Uh, Alderman Coder voted against that. You know, I was at a press conference earlier today talking about the $500 cash payments and the impact that that made to so many people on the margins in our city. Alderman Coder voted against that too. Um, I was a champion against, uh, against privatizing our airport. Alderman Coder was for that. You know, I supported the college savings accounts to give uh, kids the, the opportunity to start saving for college as soon as they enter uh, kindergarten. Alderman Coder voted against that too. You know, I think at the end of the day, if, if you look at you know, my donor base versus his donor base, what you see is I'm funded by a lot of regular, ordinary people in this city who want to see our city do well. And my opponent is funded by a lot of developers and corporate interests that want to make sure that business stays as usual, that they can get the same tax breaks that they've always been getting, um, even though taxes are rising on so many homeowners in our city. Final thoughts for voters. Anything else you want them to know about you? You know, I. What I want them to know about me is that, you know, even if we don't agree 100% of the time, I am a person that shows up constantly for our community. I believe in building a St. Louis that works for everyone, and that means showing up on people's porches, you know, knocking a lot of doors, which I've personally been doing. Um, it also means being out at community events and, and, uh, and supporting a lot of our neighborhood organizations, which is work that I've also done over the years. I think our city really needs somebody that is going to pay attention to every single segment of our city and make sure that every area of the city grows. Um, I'm committed to building a St. Louis that works for everyone. And, and so I would appreciate your vote on September 13th to, uh, to help us accomplish that vision. All right, well, thank you so much for all the time. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem.